What is the difference between lust and love? Good question. I had uh, one of my viewers ask me that recently, and you know, I want to define it from the King James Bible, and uh, so that's what we're going to do in this study. Pretty neat uh, scriptures to go over here. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and answer the question right up front, and then I'm going to, we'll go through the verses of scripture to prove what I'm saying. Um, very simple to, to break this thing down. Lust is self-serving. Love, on the other hand, is self-sacrificing. That'd be the quickest way I could define the whole thing. Lust is self-serving. Love is self-sacrificing. True love. And I understand people will say, yeah, but you know, a guy says to a woman that he loves her and, and in reality it's just lust and thing. Okay, I understand that. Love can be, the, the very word love can be twisted and things like that into lust. It's actually lust, but it's coming out of the mouth love. I understand. But I'm saying true lust is self-serving true love is self-sacrificing all right um, and I'll say it another way too if you make lust your goal in life in other words ultimate lust you just give yourself over to the lust of the flesh okay you just don't hold back whatever you feel like doing if it feels good do it you know that that mindset it will ultimately lead to your destruction anybody at all that pursues lust Whereas, you know, whatever it's in, um, it just gets worse and worse as time goes by. You become less and less happy the more you pursue your lust. Love, on the other hand, is different. True love. When you are truly a loving person and you seek to be more loving as a person, it will ultimately lead you in a positive direction and, in fact, ultimately lead you to God himself because he is the source of pure, true love. And, you know, you will find, if you're a really good, loving person, that you'll find most people are rotten. Even the very best people, there's still sin there. So you will get to a point where if you're looking for true love, it'll get you to Jesus Christ. All right? So let's see these scriptures now to back up what I'm saying here. Lust, self-serving. Love is self-sacrificing. Let's see it. Let's start out with lust. Go to Proverbs Chapter 6, in your King James Bible, don't mess with the new ones as I always say, they're from the Vatican. Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23 through 26, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Here we go, verse 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Okay, a filthy adulterous woman, a harlot, if you want to call her that, a prostitute would be the modern word. She will do things and dress in certain ways and act provocatively in ways to cause lust. She doesn't care one thing about the feelings or the emotions of the men out there that she wants as her clients. She could care less. She wants to fulfill her lusts of money, making that money, by fulfilling men's lusts of fornication. That's what she wants to do. And it ties in perfectly with the New Testament. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. We'll start there. Okay, it says here, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, I believe the Sermon on the Mount here, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, is specifically going to be the rules, the constitution, you might say, 
for the coming millennial kingdom. Uh, there's no blood atonement in the entire thing. So I understand doctrinally you have to be careful with trying to make this match Christian living today. I understand that. But instruction in righteousness, it certainly is there. Okay, uh, Looking at a woman is not a sin. But if you look at her with lust, it is a sin. Why? Self-serving, remember? You're not looking at her with love. See, it's a challenge for a man to look at a woman and say, that woman's dressed like a harlot. You know what, I love her enough to tell her that Jesus Christ died for her. I care about her. You know, I've had, I've had, I remember the one time I went, I took my two nephews to this uh, Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. It's in Lidditz, uh, Pennsylvania. And I had no idea. I mean, I'd, I'd gone when I was like really young and things and hadn't been there in many, many years. And I went in, like October, like not too far from Halloween. And they were like having this, you know, like, uh, I forget what, it, what they were calling it. But the whole thing was, I mean, just like total occultism. I mean, they had every form of divination, palm reading and crystal ball gazing. And I mean, it was just like, just covered with, you know, people in the occult and the incredible. I mean, pentagrams and just... Uh, it was bad and you know I'm like walking around going okay this is really really bad I remember I took my nephews they were both right around early teen years and we went into this one knife slash sword shop and uh, I mean it, you know there were some decent stands there and things people you know craftsmen and things so it was like you know paid to get into the thing I, as I'm walking through I'm going okay there's a lot of occultism here but we're there, and so I thought, well, I'll take them around and uh, just kind of explain some things to them as we're walking around. But and anyways, we went into this uh, this sword shop, and this, this girl comes walking up to me, one of the workers there. She was a worker, all right, and she had this really low-cut top on, and she had this Egyptian ankh around her neck, which in the occult is a symbol for uh, orgies, sex orgies. And she comes up, and she's like, you know, doing the whole thing to accentuate you know and, and she's like can I help you and all it's seductive and everything else and it was just like I thought I know what you want me to do you want me to look right down there you know I mean she's like almost falling out of her top and so I just looked at her right in the face and I started talking to her you know and as, as soon as I started getting even close to witnessing it was like okay well I mean I'm out of there and I saw some real weird people there that day I mean there was some people possessed with devils and they were acting like I mean real like like almost afraid of me kind of thing as I was walking around and I'm like taking pictures you know I'm going to expose this thing and I, I have talked about it in other studies but she wanted to inspire lust how by the way she was dressed and by the way she did her her eyes and things and seductive speech and everything else you know uh-huh yeah see now was it a sin for me to look at her no, it would have been a sin if I would have lusted after her. See, I committed no sin in trying to witness to her. All right? Why? Because I love her as a, she's a soul. She's going to go to heaven or hell when she dies. But if I would have turned that into lust, you know, again, I remember I went door to door the one time with a Baptist church and we were out there and a the guy I was with and this girl comes to the front door and she's got this real low cut top on and things and, and he's just like, looking down and, and he tried to look up and he looked back down again and I could see she had this smirk on her face. She knew what she what he was looking at. And so I just kind of took over the conversation. I was supposed to be the silent guy at that time and I was like, let me just ask you a question. And I just, you know, and he stopped talking and I started to witness to her and I just, right in her eyes, I did not look down and give her the pleasure of, you know, thinking that she had me too. But there are women out there that are harlots, they'll do that. They'll try to get you to lust after them. All right? It's not a sin if you are looking with love towards that person saying that's an eternal soul there that I want to witness to. But you've got to be real careful that it doesn't turn into lust. And for you ladies out there, let me tell you something. You say, oh, how I dress doesn't matter. Please. Yes, it does. Bible back in uh, Proverbs chapter 7 I think it is talks about a woman with the attire of an harlot and I realize it's so common nowadays for women to dress in very provocative ways and things I mean women wearing stuff 
that, you know, women a hundred years ago wouldn't have worn as a bathing suit, okay? And they wear that out in public now. It's crazy. But uh, let's continue here, the thing of lust. Romans chapter 1. And, you know, I realize that there are men that dress very inappropriately, too, as well. I'm not just putting it all on the women and saying, you know, you women, you better dress, you know, really modestly, and it's, you, how dare you. There are men that can dress very provocatively. You know, you walk around with a muscle shirt on and things like this, and you wear short shorts or something. You know, like if you're jogging shorts. I'm not saying wearing girly shorts or something, but, you know, better not be. Any, if you are, you got other problems, but... <laughs> But, you know, men can also dress in ways to get women's attract or uh, attention. It's a bad thing if you're causing lust, people to fall into sin. Romans chapter 1, verses 25 through 27. It says here, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. You know what leads people into sodomy? I know a bunch of former sodomites almost every single time it's based on somewhat normal relationships, you know, man and woman at first, and it doesn't work, and it goes from there, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon you're going over and you're messing around. Men with men, women with women. But almost always it starts out man and woman, before they go man and man, or woman and woman. And what happens? You get into the thing of lust, and you start to take it to the next step. And then you go to the next step, and then you go to the next, and you go to the next. Pornography is the same way. Most men, I'm not going to speak for women because, you know, I don't have any experience with that. I know women do have problems with pornography, but I'll speak to men because I used to be in this exact situation. Men will start out with a Playboy magazine or something like that that just shows a woman. And then it's, well, what about a woman and a man? And that's, well, maybe about two women. And then it goes and gets worse and worse and worse from there. And I thank the Lord I never got into really, really, really dark areas of pornography, into child porn or, you know, animals and people, bestiality and things, weird stuff like that. You know, I'm thankful I never got into that level. But I know what happens with lust. And you talk about burning with lust and things. The Bible talks about that. Yeah, you'll feel that. Where your flesh is just uncontrollably just... And as a Christian, a lot of times, I know Christians will struggle with this stuff. I did. When I first got saved, you know, and uh, and you'll just feel like you're fighting, and you're just going like, no, no, I can't look at it. Oh, but I just, oh, I have to. And but I, I, I can't. God, please help me. And it's, oh man, lust is very strong. Lust is very, very strong. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. You can listen to my video on pornography epidemic uh, for more on how to fight the thing of pornography addiction. If you have a problem with that, I would recommend that very very uh, strongly. But go next to Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Here's another aspect of it. Because most people, when they think lust, they think sexual things. Um, sins of the flesh that are you know sexual in nature and things like that. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Look at this. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Hmm. What consumes your mind? Have you ever been consumed by the lust for a material thing? Different definition of lust than what most people think of. But the matter, the fact of the matter is, you see some brand new vehicle or some motorcycle or some material thing, whatever it is, and you just lust after it. And it just consumes your mind and you just think, oh, just to, when I get the money, boy, I'm just, oh, I can't wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get one of those things. Somebody says, do you really need it? Well, no, but, you know, I, I just, oh, I, I just want that thing. 
it's going to make me look really cool or it's going to be this or it's going to be that. It's lust. You might not have a problem with pornography or fornication or sodomy or whatever else, but I'll tell you what, you can lust after material things and burn just as much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I myself have done that as well, unfortunately. And you say, well, you know, what, are, what makes you think you're qualified to preach then? Well, because I'm fighting that stuff. And as a Christian, you will fight those things. You'll go through times where you're just going to be like, oh, you'll fail, you know, and then you get back up and you, you know, that's the Christian life. Uh, God doesn't expect you to be perfectly sinless. Uh, if, he, if he expected that, he wouldn't have sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross as a perfectly sinless man. You could become perfectly sinless yourself. So he would just try to get you to the point where you're perfectly sinless and then you'd be caught up or something like that. I mean, <laughs> no. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is imparted to you. Right. But say, well, then, then I guess I can continue in sin. No. <laughs> Read Romans chapter 6 sometime on that. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here as we we talk about Jesus here in just a little bit but Galatians chapter 5 turn over there Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through uh, 17 Galatians 5 verse 16 this I say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You know what the number one problem with modern Christianity is? These modern Bible buildings and stuff? They try to combine the flesh and the spirit. If it feels good, they'll, they'll try to do it. They'll try to justify it and say, you know, they'll, they'll put their hands up, you know, and stuff like this. And, I mean, show me that in Scripture. <laughs> you don't see people doing that, you know, that put their hands up in the, you know. And these rock concerts and stuff like this. Where's the stuff at in Scripture? And ironic that it just showed up in the last, you know, what, since the 19... I don't even know. Uh, first rock churches around and stuff, probably 1970s, 1980s. Not very popular until probably the turn of the century. Start getting into the 21st century, you get these rock churches everywhere. And now the people, they're just, it's all about the flesh. Everything. And they, they try to convince themselves, well, it's... This is the Holy Spirit because I feel good. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you right now, um, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is really, really upon you and He's really showing you truth, you're going to notice that your flesh doesn't feel good many times. The Holy Spirit will come in and He'll just go, mm, and He'll poke you sometimes, and you just go, you read something in the Bible, it's like, oh no, that's, that's what I'm doing. And the Lord's just like, yeah, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I listen to preaching sometimes and it's just like, you know, some guy says something and it's just like the Holy Spirit just goes, <clears throat> and just jabs me and I'm just, oh no, you know. <laughs> Why? Because the flesh and the Spirit are against each other. I know Dr. Ruckman used to draw a, a drawing. He'd have a white dog and a black dog. And the black dog represents the flesh and the white dog represents the Spirit. And he'd say, if you feed the white dog, he'll beat up the black one. If you feed the black one, he'll beat up the white one. You know. And what are you going to feed? The spirit or the flesh? The spirit feeds on the Bible. Prayer. The right kind of Christian music. Music that's soothing, that puts you into, into a, a, a state of mind where you want to worship the Lord. It calms you down. Conversation with other Christians and things like that. That's the what the spirit feeds on. The flesh feeds on television, entertainment, covetousness, lust, dirty jokes, junk food. Mm -hmm. Let's continue. James chapter 1. Here's a really good definition for the thing of lust and why you need to avoid it as a Christian. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, 
neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now let's go back to my analogy I told you earlier. The story, it was a true story. I went to that Renaissance Fair thing. This girl comes up, and clearly, I mean, she's into the occult. She's got the onk thing around her neck. She's very immodest. Let's just say I wouldn't have looked at her with eyes of love for her soul and said, you know, I tried to get to the point of witnessing. It did not happen. She just got out of there quick. Um, but let's just say I'd had this thought in me and I'd have said, I bet you I could, uh, you know, you know, uh, have a, a time with her. I'll say it that way. I'll try to be gentle here. <laughs> you know, fornicate with her. Let's just say I did that. I start lusting after her. What would have happened? When lust hath conceived, you allow it, allow it to be conceived, you allow it to be born within you, you start to say, oh boy, she's, oh man, look at, oh boy, she's, it's conceived. It bringeth forth sin. Fornication. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. What would have happened to my ministry way back when? I was the early part of my ministry, probably about, 2010 2011 you know 2007 is when i got started but you know 2010 and 11 was things were really uh picking up and bible believers fellowship and king james video ministries had both of those at that time you know and uh what would have happened to my ministry had it come out that i had basically fornicated with this girl in the occult it would have killed my ministry and she might have had some kind of sexually transmitted disease I could have got that it could have ended up costing me my life hmm you see how about uh, coveting after material things when lust hath conceived I have to have that new car that's the sports car so I'm not saying it's wrong to have a new car brother and get don't get me wrong it's not wrong to get new clothes or to get things like that coveting is after things that you don't need all right things that you want, those those desires that you're just like, I just have to have it. Do you need it? No, but I have to have it. That's where covetousness comes in at. You go and you say, I have to have this new vehicle or whatever else. It's just all oh, the latest, it's the coolest, whatever else. What happens next? It leads to sin. That sin of you start to, I can't give money to the Lord or I can't this and I can't that because I got to save up for that car and whatever else. And it, you know, covetousness is a is a great sin as well. You know, so it's not just you know wasting all your money on this thing that you don't need. It's also the sin of covetousness. See, and what's it lead to? Death. You work too hard to get that thing, or you? I mean, any myriad of things. I mean, you can you can fill in the blanks there. You know what I'm saying? Lust is self-serving. Lust will lead to your ultimate death every single time. I mean, when have you ever said, you know, somebody said, boy, I went and I, I lusted after this, and boy, it sure worked out good. <laughs> no. Lust is not a good thing. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. And, it, you know, this doing the notes on this study it was just like you know you start getting into this and i'm going okay there's so many arguments i could use here i mean there are just lots and lots and lots of references here that i could go over but i don't want to get too far off the topic but uh, there's definitely a lot more scriptures on both lust and love but we're just going to hit the the good ones here for the study first john chapter 2 verse 15 through 17 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Pretty strong condemnation there. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Hmm. Something to think about there. Do you know how many uh, 
2017 uh, Chevy Corvettes are going to burn when this world is destroyed? All of them? Do you know how many uh, 6,500 square foot mansions are going to burn someday? All of them? What about the priceless jewelry? It's all going to burn. Oh, do you remember, uh, you know, name some beautiful woman from the past? Go back to the early 1900s and talk about some of the movie actresses that were around back then that just men lusted after. Most people don't even know who they were now. I can't name one. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. You know, some woman from the early, early, early Hollywood back in the early 1900s. I can't honestly name one off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up or something like that. But uh, she mattered to a lot of people way back when. A lot of the guys in war and things, you know, they had their little pinup girls and stuff. They had little pictures and things like this, and they lust after her. Where is she now? Well, if she didn't get saved, she's in hell burning. The world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Hmm. It's really something to think about. Lust, being self-serving, passes away. I mean, how many things have you thought were so important that you needed to have it? Just, oh, i, I got to get it. Just your whole life, every waking moment. I just have to think about, oh, and everything else. And you work your way up to that thing and you get it. And you're just like, you know, walking around. I gotta, I can't use the Bible. I don't want to say that. I'll just say this marker here. Usually set my sights on something higher than a highlighter, but let's just say this is something very special. And you're walking around, you're like, hey, did you see my new highlighter? You have, oh, that's a nice highlighter. Yeah, I know it is, you know, and everything else. And after a little while, it's just like. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Some new car that you just had to have? Some new outfit, if you know, or clothes, or jewelry, or whatever or new relationship and you just think to yourself this is it this is this is just oh man i'm just oh this is so exciting and everything else a little while later you're just going why about why the bible says to set your affection on things above or those things don't corrupt anything that you set your affection on down here on this earth it's going to fall apart I think that's a good place to, to get into the thing of love. Let's talk about love. Go back in your Bible to Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, I got as I'm preaching this, it's just like, a lot of times I'm preaching and the Lord just picks on me the whole time I'm preaching, you know. I just don't appreciate that much, but... He does it, whether I appreciate it or not. <laughs> just like, I'm getting kicked here like crazy doing this, and I'm like, yeah, you know, things. And I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm just going like, okay, Lord, we, we do need another house, you know, and things, and it's like, it's not covetousness, is it? <laughs> See, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, He will do that thing, and He will start to poke you and prod you and pinch you and say, how about that and things? And it's good for you. It causes you to examine yourself. When you get so prideful that you think to yourself, well, I just don't agree. And I, well, I just don't you know, think. Just be open to the Holy Spirit's correction. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you about something that you're struggling with right now. And if He gets me to say it and I, I step on your toes a little bit, well, okay, fine. But if I don't say the particular thing that you're struggling with, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal it to you. Be open to His leading, brethren. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Let's talk about love now. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. What's the New Testament tie into that? Matthew chapter 22. That's Old Testament under the law. Well, I understand that. And technically, Matthew 22 is still Old Testament because it's before the death of the testator. Read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. Before Jesus dies on the cross, doctrinally, you are still in the Old Testament. 
All right, the New Testament comes in when Jesus dies on the cross. So I know we're going to uh, hear what Jesus said before he died on the cross. But I'm going to show you it lines up with what we have today in the Pauline epistles. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Master, which is the great commandment? Uh, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So Jesus refers back to what we just read there in Deuteronomy. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All right. In other words, they they're connected to these things. They hang on those two commandments. All right. Why? Well, explain that. Well, okay. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Why don't you steal? Well, if you love God, you trust that He's going to provide for you, and you trust. And you know, if you love God, you also say, well, "I better not do this thing, because I'll get in trouble with Him." See. And if you're stealing, you don't really love your neighbor that you're stealing from. You see how that thing works? You do any kind of thing. Honor thy father and mother. Why? Well, because you love God. You see? With all your heart, heart, soul, and mind. You're thankful for him giving you parents and allowing you to be born and giving you life and everything else. It works out. Let's go next to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 21. Put this little piece of paper there so I don't get some of the other ones mixed up. John 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. Uh, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now, let me just say something here, because all these little Hebrew roots cultist people, the, the people that are not Jewish, and they try to be Jewish, they come along and they say, you're to keep the commandments. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not one of them can fulfill that. Not one of them is keeping all the commandments of God. That's a lie. It's kind of funny. That's not what Jesus is saying in this passage. He's just saying, keep those things as in, do you believe in them? Are you trying to follow them in things? It's not that you're meriting salvation, you see. All right. It's not like saying... I'm going to get married to somebody and, and you know, I'm, I'm married to my wife and I expect her to never make a mistake. Well, that's ridiculous. Right? That'd be absurd. I couldn't ex put those kind of standards on her. Well, the Lord's not going to put standards on us saying we have to keep the commandments to merit salvation. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's Catholic. You have to die in a state of grace and then you might be saved. And if mostly, likely, you won't be saved and you're going to have to burn in purgatory for a while and things like this and your relatives up here whipping themselves and beating themselves and saying Hail Marys and whatever else, you know, to try to get you out of purgatory quicker. Stupid nonsense, okay? Uh, you, you're not going to be able to keep the commandments to merit salvation. Uh, the point of what Jesus is saying there is love, if you love him, you're going to love what he's written in this book. You're going to love this book and you're going to try to live by this book. You're going to keep these things in mind. Not that you're keeping them to be saved, all right? Understand that. Look over chapter 15, John 15, verse 12, down through verse 19. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Is that, is that self-sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, right there, another great description of love versus lust. If you have lust... You're not going to lay down your life for friends. You're not going to say, I'm going to have to give up my own life. You know, there's many stories of uh, soldiers back in World War II, I think, probably that era, and they'd get a, sometimes a grenade would plop down into the foxhole where they were at, and one of the guys would jump on it and let the explosion go off in his stomach. 
Why? To save his friends? To save his fellow soldiers? He would risk, well not risk, he would take, you know, lose his life jumping on a grenade to save his friends. Why? Love. Not because of lust. And of course Jesus Christ is the ultimate example. He died for sinners. Verse 14, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not when, what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another." You know, love, and we're going to get into this as we continue. Love does not necessarily mean that you're just this frothing, little, nice, just doesn't ever offend anybody. All right? It doesn't mean that. Let's continue. I'll show you this. Verse 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. I thought we were supposed to be loving and, and everything else. Yeah, but the world will hate you for it. Verse 19, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Yeah. See, wait a second. This doesn't make any sense. We're supposed to be loving as Christians, and, that the, and yet the world's going to hate us for it. Yeah, you know why? Because a loving Christian goes up to a lost family member or friend or co-worker or whatever and just simply says, you're going to go to hell when you die if you reject Jesus Christ. Now, why'd you say that? Is it out of lust? No. That's certainly not the way to achieve something if you're lusting. Okay? You go up to somebody and offend them. Uh, what's it out of? Love? Do you love that person? Do you want to see them dying and going to hell? You say, no, of course not. I don't, I don't want that on anybody. Okay, then you have the love of, of Jesus Christ in you. But guess what it'll get you? It'll get their hatred. How dare you say that? Who are you to judge me? You know, the whole thing. You know, the rest of the stuff that you'll get. But let me show you some things here. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. This is what you can present to lost people that you know. Okay, it says here, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Remember what we read earlier? Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Right there you're reading about it. Verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I've said I had a whole study on this thing. Does God love lost sinners? And the fact of the matter is, no. God does not love, present tense, lost sinners. He loved them. We just read it. Christ died for us. That is the love that was shed on the cross. Well, I, I don't know about this cross stuff. Okay, then God's not, love is not there for you. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died one time in the past. He died once. That's why he said it is finished. It's not Roman Catholic salvation of you've got to continually sacrifice him in the Mass, the Eucharistic sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where you're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And they believe that it's literally changed into that after the priest does his little Latin hocus-pocus ceremony. I'm not joking. All right. If you go up to a Catholic priest and say that's just wine and a little wheat wafer thing, they'll they'll that's heresy to them. They believe it's changed in the actual flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Don't understand the love that God shed, you know, through Jesus dying on the cross. Romans 8:28. What's our purpose? The whole purpose? 
to love God with all our heart, soul, body, and mind. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Do you love God? You say, yeah, I think I do. Okay. Are you willing to sacrifice for Him? Or how much time do you want to spend down here on the earth chasing after things that are going to burn? Running after things that are just going to be gone someday? I mean, you know, and it's even for a Christian, I mean, I'm, I'm talking, you know, during the time of Jacob's trouble, most things are going to be burned. You know, you get to the end of the thing and there's all kinds of stuff burned and whatever else. There's judgments where a third of all the trees are burned and all the green grass is burned up. Sure, but in Second Peter chapter 3, the whole earth is burned up and everything in it. So even if you have something that kind of survives the time of Jacob's trouble and goes through the millennial kingdom, at the end of that, the whole world burns up. All right? There's that there. But for a Christian that's saved right now in what we would call the church age, you're going to get to a point someday where all of a sudden you're going to hear your name and come up hither. And all of this stuff, everything, gone just like that. Why? Well, it's not going to be gone. You're going to be gone, but it's going to be down here. You're not going to get up there to the clouds and go, oh, good, you know, and there's a storage unit over here parked in, or you know, a U-Haul truck or something like this, and you look over and you go, and the Lord says, oh, that's all your stuff. Don't worry about it. You know, we're going to, we moved it all into your mansion in heaven. You're going to have it for all of eternity. <laughs> you know, no. So again, what are you spending your time on? You know, I'll just kick myself a few times here, you know. It's a challenge, brethren. Where's your love at? All things work together for good to them that love God. Do you love Him with everything that you have? Or are there some lusts that you need to get rid of? Jump down to verse 35. Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A couple points that need to be made there. Okay. Number one, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. When you study church history, you will be shocked at how much uh, Christians have been persecuted down through the centuries. I mean, we are living in a very unique time that was basically Christians getting just slaughtered and slaughtered and slaughtered and they fought to the point where Christians would have freedom. And now if you look at the news and you see this whole thing of Islamic, you know, Muslims moving in and taking over whole areas and things like this and calling for Sharia law and all this other stuff and, and you see the atheists, you know, the uh, what's the organization, these fools here in America, Freedom from Religion or something like that, I think it's called. And you see all these things. There's still that little veneer, a thin little veneer of the politically correct diversity, tolerance, that whole thing. And the sodomite, the radical sodomite agenda, growing and growing and growing, where they're, they're insinuating, they aren't quite there yet, but they're insinuating that people that believe what the Bible says, that sodomy is wrong, they're, they're wicked. You know, and you get these people into the whole psychiatry and the medical field and all this other stuff. Medical field, you know, we need to forcibly vaccinate people. And if you're not vaccinating your kids, something's wrong with you. And we should probably take your children from you. You know, you can see it building up again. You can see it. And the Jesuits moving into key positions in government and the Catholic Church taking over key things and stuff. There's a great persecution coming, brethren. 
Are we going to be you know, experiencing any of it before the rapture? I don't know. I honestly think it depends primarily on how much Christians fight against this world system. How many times we come out and we say, hey, that's wrong and this is wrong and whatever else. We need to fight. We need to resist out of love. That should be your motivation, brethren. Self-sacrifice. There's going to be times when you're going to much rather go out and do something with your day and you just forget the tracks, leave them at home. I'll just ask some other time. Do you love God? Are you willing to make some sacrifices for Him? And let me tell you something too, Christian. It's going to get to the point where you're going to get this question put on you. The Lord's going to convict your heart about verse 36. Because you can look at that and you go, oh yeah, you sure. Let's move on. Focus on verse 36 for a minute. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Will it be more like Jesus Christ? Are you ready to have the world hate you to the point of wanting to kill you? And maybe doing that eventually? Would you be willing to be tortured for Jesus Christ? And love those that are doing it? Try to witness to them? Can we go on to another subject, please? But i got to say another thing here. Let that kind of conviction just kind of stew a little bit there. It's hard, isn't it? I don't want to be tortured. <laughs> but that's what our text says. But let's, let's look at another little issue here. Kind of give you a little bit more positive thing to think on. Uh, verses 37 through 39. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. But let me just... I was going to make another point, but let me say this. If you do get tortured, if you do get killed for Jesus Christ, you go to heaven, okay? And you'll obtain a better resurrection. You'll get a crown of a martyr, you know, at the judgment seat of Christ. So, don't sweat it, all right? I mean, the Lord knows how to how to protect you and everything else. Even if things really fall apart, He can still protect Christians. All right, so, don't get too worried about it. Just, you know, get that thing settled in your mind and just say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for you as hard as I can to try and avoid this you know, Roman Catholic takeover thing and they start torturing Christians and a new inquisition and things started. And they, by the way, they still have the, the Office of Inquisition in the Vatican. It's called some new thing now. I forget. Office of Faith or something like that. I forget. But uh, Doctrine of Faith. or something. I, I can't remember it, but you can look that up. But let me make another point here. Verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the posties out there, these little post tribbers, how does that work? these verses work out? If you believe that Christians go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the Antichrist, you can be forced to take the mark and worship the beast and his image, you get God's wrath. How does that work? You can put Romans chapter 8 for a Christian and go into the tribulation time period. No, you can't. No, you can't. You're reading something that's written to Christians right here in Romans 8, and the Christians are leaving before the Antichrist shows up. Otherwise, the Scriptures would contradict. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. But those people, anybody that takes the mark goes to hell. It doesn't work. And I mean, look at all the different things there. Describing stuff that's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Death. You know, the red horse rider brings war. The black rider brings famine. The pale rider, death and hell. Death can't separate you. From the love of God? Something to think about. Nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. Is the Antichrist a power? And he can't separate you from the love of Christ if you take his mark? Kind of weird. Well, let's continue with our study. Romans chapter 12.
Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. It says here, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. What does dissimulation mean? It means being fake. Let your love be without fakeness would be another way to say it, without being a fraud with it. Oh, hi. Oh, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you, you know, when you don't mean it. <laughs> um, sometimes you're going to be viewed as being quite rude as a, as a Christian. Because if you have to be honest, sometimes you just have to tell it like it is. You know, and again, you can love the person. You're like, I want you to know the truth. I, I, want, I want you to see this. And they say, well, I just don't agree with you. And you say, you want to say in your mind, your flesh is going, I really want to get along with this person. I've known them since I was a child, or I, I really like them. They're, they're, my, they're my best friend, or whatever else. And your flesh is going, well, okay, I guess we can agree to disagree. Mm -mm, no. If you know that the Bible teaches something and they're rejecting it, you have to say, you're wrong. And if it's bad enough, if they're a lost person, you say, you're going to go to hell. What? Why would you say that to me? Don't you know how much that hurts me? Do you love them? Or is that lust there? Where you want the flesh to feel good. Their flesh and your flesh to get along. If you love them, you're going to tell them the truth. The Lord's used that thing on me a couple times. Let me tell you. I mean, I've had some times... Uh, former friends and things like that and they come along and they try to talk to me and it's just like uh, you know and I'm fighting in my mind I'm going I just want to be like oh you know how uh, uh, hey it's good to see you again and stuff like this and something spiritual comes up and I'm just like well you know the Bible says it, and it, you can just see the countenance change and it's like you know all right man why, why would you bring that up you know <laughs> and it's just like oh here we go you know scratch off another friend <laughs> <laughs> but why do you do it? If you love them, you're going to tell them the truth. Yeah. How about uh, family members? Relatives. They mean a lot to you. Are you going to lie to them so that you can get along? Or do you love them enough to tell them the truth? Hmm. Let's continue on. Romans chapter 13. Verses 8 through 10. O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What do we read back there with Jesus? And back in Deuteronomy? Old Testament comes up through. Jesus confirms it. And here it is in the Pauline epistles. Love God first. Love your neighbor second. On those two commandments, hang the rest of the commandments. Yeah. Verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love your friends? Do you love your coworkers? Are you going to tell them the truth? Or are you going to get lust in there that says, I want to get along? I'll just kind of conceal some things here so as not to get their hatred. First Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hmm. That's what it really comes down to. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of lost people, 
Let him be anathema maranatha. What does that mean? Damned at his coming. Anathema means damned maranatha at his coming. Let them be damned at his coming. You see, what's your motivation for witnessing to the lost? If it's lust, it's going to be, I led 3,000 souls to the Lord. I am one of the greatest soul winners that's ever lived. I, my church is sitting, you know, 5,000 in Sunday school and we, you know, that's lust. If it's based on love, you're going to be going out there. You're going to have charity. You're going to have self-sacrificial love for people. And you're going to realize, hey, can I give you this? Can I tell you about this book? Can I give you the truth? Get that thing out of here. I don't want it. You better accept it because this is the way of truth. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He loved you enough to die for you. Will you accept him? Get that thing out of you, narrow-minded bigot. Well, okay, go on to the next one. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Damn that is coming. Not because you want it. Not because you're saying, hey, you're going to hell, buddy, and stuff, getting carnal with it and things. No, no. But that's just the reality of it. And if you love the Lord first and foremost, you're not going to compromise when you get chances to witness for Jesus Christ. So, the answer to the question is simply, um, what's the difference between lust and love? Lust is when you serve yourself. Love is when you sacrifice yourself. So that is going to be it. Just a challenging message, you know. Um, I hope the Lord's pricked your heart. If you're saved, if you're lost, you need to think about it too. There is no greater show of love that the Lord can give you than what happened at the cross. He let his son die in your place to pay for your sins. What a great show of love. If you reject it, you're going to be damned at his coming. As a Christian, um, you're going to struggle with the thing of lust versus love. And I pray that the Holy Spirit goes out and knocks on your heart right now and says, hey, you need to clean this up or you need to clean that thing up or whatever else. Examine yourself. Right? It's not a sin to have things. It's, you know, this is a fairly new shirt. I haven't had this thing for very long. Was it a sin for me to buy it? No. Is it a sin for me to buy one that has have gold thread in it and it's custom made? And whatever. Yeah, I wouldn't need that. You know, we're looking about a, a house here soon. You know, we've been praying about one for a long time now. Is that a sin? No. But should I lust after some mansion here on the earth? I get my mansion in heaven. Why do I want one here on the earth? You see? So that is going to be it. I hope the Lord has challenged you. Uh, not through me. Whatever. I'm just a preacher. I hope He's challenged you through His Word. And uh, work it out between you and Him. That is going to be it. Thank you for watching.